Good morning. Thanks for being here with us. Um, so in these times of COVID, uh, it's easy to uh, forget or um, direct our attention elsewhere away from the terrible other epidemic we've had in our communities for many years now, and that is uh, drug addiction and overdose deaths. Um, as it was already mentioned, uh, we gather every year to really raise awareness and listen to stories of those who've suffered and who we've lost. And uh, this year, that day is on August 31st. That's Overdose Awareness Day. And we'll hear a bit more about that in a few minutes. But <clears throat> substance use disorder is really a disease that continues to deeply affect our community, uh, our state, our country, um, uh, uh, terrible uh, impacts on all of us. I've had members of my own family uh, suffer from this terrible disease. I've seen it firsthand and the damage it can do. And I've also seen the stigma associated with it and how, how that really hampers our ability to help those that really need the help. So I really believe working together, we can end the stigma of addiction. We can do this by actively supporting individuals and families who are in the midst of addiction and helping those that are uh, in treatment and who will accept services and who are in recovery. And recovery is a long, hard road and people going through that really need all our support. We also know that addiction thrives in uh, people that are uh, isolated and um, uh, separated from others. That's one driving factor and we're seeing a real uh, increase in cases uh, throughout the uh, community also during this time of COVID. In 2019, we lost 153 people in Snohomish County to an overdose. And uh, in the first quarter of this year, we've already lost 39 community members. So we're on track to have more overdose deaths if that number holds throughout the year. Uh, we know that there's a lot of work we still need to do. Uh, there is hope. Uh, I'm really committed to Snohomish County being there in a resource, and we're going to continue and expand as we can our efforts through the law enforcement embedded social worker teams, the Carnegie Resource Center, the old Carnegie Library, and the Diversion Center. And we also will work to strengthen our partnerships with community-based organizations and providers. You know, this has got to be a team effort with uh, county government, our service providers, and our families and community working together on this issue. And also uh, want to thank first responders in Snohomish County. Last year, they saved 642 lives through the use of naloxone, amazing success story uh, and a, a ray of hope. And this year, they've already saved 413 lives through the month of June. So uh, it's, a, it's a high number. And uh, if that number holds, again, we're going to see an increase this year over last year. So whether you're experiencing a family member or friend with active addiction, um, you might be in recovery or know somebody in recovery or uh, really around somebody who needs help. Uh, please know that we are allies in the struggle. We're going to continue to work to end the stigma. Anybody in any family, anywhere can uh, succumb to this disease. It's, and it's not anything to be ashamed of or sorry for, it is a, um, a terrible disease. Uh, these drugs are highly addictive and uh, people who uh, enter into drug use for one reason or another, it may be uh, pain relief. Um, it happened in my family, some of the bad back uh, really got addicted and it was a long, hard struggle. So there's nothing to be ashamed of and we really need to work to end the stigma associated with uh, drug use. So. With that, uh, I uh, will turn it over to Dr. Spitters for some comments. Thank you, Executive Summers, and good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I want to just make a couple of quick comments about uh, COVID-19. 
Uh, yesterday afternoon, we released our new snapshot and detailed weekly report through August 15, as well as new case counts and our updated two-week case rate. We're now continuing to see decreases in overall transmission, now down to 60 cases per 100,000 per two weeks for, for the last two-week period. Uh, you'll recall that the last, uh, last week we reported that that had come down from the high 90s down to 75, so now down to 60. So we've got now uh, two to three weeks of sustained improvements, and that's encouraging news. We certainly want it to continue and that largely means not letting up on all the good efforts of late happening out there in the community by you people uh, doing the, the usual, wearing face coverings in public, trying to maintain distance in public spaces from people who aren't in your household and limiting your gatherings to five people or less, ideally the same five people over time, sort of have a, your, your, uh, your friend cohort and try not to expand behind you on that. I also want to reiterate a comment from last week about schools as we see the rate falling below 75 per 100,000. Recall, you'll recall that that 75 per 100,000 threshold is at the very top of the medium risk category laid out in the Safe Start framework for schools. While we're trending in the right direction, 60 is still a high transmission rate and there's quite a ways to go before we get down to 25 which is the threshold for entering into a low transmission category. A lot of planning and preparation is being done by the schools and they continue to work to strike the delicate balance to optimize health and learning opportunities for students, while also trying to be uh, safe and flexible uh, for families and the entire school community. Please continue to follow your local schools for updates on fall learning plans and schedules. Uh, now I'd like to turn uh, attention uh, back to the opioid issue brought up by Dr. brought up by Executive Summers, and uh, talk to you about some new data portals that the health district has been working on setting up. Even with an all hands response to the COVID pandemic occurring, Snohomish County and the Snohomish Health District, along with other partners in the community, continue to move forward with work focused on opioid use prevention, treatment, and recovery. While this work has taken longer than we originally anticipated, we are excited to unveil some new hubs for opioid data in Snohomish County. We will be sharing links to those hubs in the chat box, as well as a more detailed press release will be going out in a few minutes containing this information. But I'd like right now to share my screen to just give a quick overview of the look of the dashboard. So if you'll, uh, be patient with me for a minute. I'll try to pull that up. And you should now be seeing a, uh, a kind of a brown and white screen uh, with Snohomish Overdose Pre Prevention is the home page, and we're here on the, the uh, data page. And this portal was developed in partnership with Live Stories, and it will continue to be an evolving dashboard with data inputs being shared by multiple partners involved in the multi-agency coordination or MAC group uh, working here in Snohomish County on opioid prevention or opioid overdose prevention. On the screen, you'll see four major categories, overdoses and deaths, community impacts, treatment and recovery, and usage and prescribing. Each one of these tiles is clickable and we'll bring you up data at, on the background uh, of, that, of that panel. So as an example, let's take a look at opioid-related visits to two, our two large uh, Snohomish County emergency departments over the past several years. And I'll just highlight some things you can do. One, you can uh, hover over the line to get exact data points. And uh, then if we back up for just a minute and look at this slide over time, I think we see a, a couple of things. First is back in the second half, uh, beginning in the second quarter of 2018, on through the first quarter of 2019, we saw a dramatic increase, almost a doubling from 67 to 120 ED visits uh, for, for overdose. 
Then it's been up and down in the year since then, but again, we're in the past uh, quarter, we're seeing a trend upwards that we don't know where this will go yet, and we'll continue to monitor that. Um, I want to mention that uh, thanks to the overdose data and action grant with, from the Department of Health and the Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention, the Health District is able to partner with Providence and Swedish to collect the data and also to follow up on overdose uh, visit patients presenting to their emergency departments. So now I want to give you one other look and we'll see an even more marked uh, trend when we look at overdose deaths in the past year, even less in, in Sohomish County. So we were down here at, at about a year ago uh, with a total uh, all drug overdose deaths at 29, opioid at 18, and just a uh, stunning increase uh, through the first quarter, through the second quarter of 2020, uh, the vast majority of that being due to opioids, 52 of the 64 uh, uh, overdose related deaths. When we look at which drug type, we can see that uh, synthetic opioids are taking an increasing role here over time. That's this uh, teal colored bar. And for 2020, uh, this data is, is uh, we're, we're halfway through the year and we've already eclipsed the number of synthetic opioid deaths that were witnessed in 2019. Uh, and when I say synthetic opioids, that's usually fentanyl and it's related uh, compounds. Okay. So this more recent data is still very pre preliminary, but we're starting to see, uh, uh, you know, in increases uh, sustained over time, particularly due to, due to fentanyl and related drugs. And uh, We've been hearing anecdotal reports of these increases in recent months uh, as we deal with the COVID crisis and some of the factors that predispose people to even be more likely to get involved with these drugs or overdose from them are occurring in the context of our COVID interventions. And these data uh, now provide some factual basis to underlie those, those reports. So I'm now gonna stop sharing my screen and come back to you all. So clearly COVID has changed so many things in our community, including the ability of those struggling with substance abuse disorders to seek health services and access treatment. There have been some changes made at the state and federal level to help streamline processes and make it easier for people to connect with telehealth and get medication assisted treatment programs going. Medication assisted treatment is a palette of options for opioid replacement using drugs that block cravings, withdrawal symptoms, and drug-seeking behavior without uh, creating the high that lead people to seek after those drugs. Examples in include buprenorphine, with or without naloxone, uh, commonly known as suboxone, but also there's naltrexone and methadone are also uh, alternatives for some patients. But we also know there's more to do, and that's why we're grateful for the ongoing partnerships with the county's MAC group, as well as the resources from the State Department of Health, the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Federal Health Resources and Services Administration, uh, and AmeriCorps VISTA, all of whom are providing resources to us locally to continue this work. This morning's press release will also share more about a recent $1 million grant we received from HRSA to implement prevention, treatment, and recovery plans in Darrington and parts of Sky Valley. But we also are incredibly fortunate to have so many community members championing efforts to connect people to resources and reduce the stigma around substance abuses, uh, excuse me, around substance use disorder. I will now turn it over to Debbie Warfield to share more about their fourth annual event for International Overdose Awareness Day. Oh, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Spitters. Um, yeah, my name is Debbie Warfield, and uh, just want to share a little about um, the International Overdose Awareness Day, which is recognized on August 31st. 
it's a, a global event and it's a time to bring awareness of overdose and to reduce the stigma around drug-related deaths and the disease of addiction. It also acknowledges grief felt by families and friends and offers us a chance to remember those who have died or suffered permanent injury. And like most of you, I didn't realize that this day even existed until we lost our son, Spencer, to an overdose in 2012. And looking at Dr. Spitter's chart, when I see 2012, it still amazes me that Spencer is one of those deaths in Snohomish County. Um, and we didn't share uh, his passing until about, uh, let me re say that again, we didn't share how he passed until about four years um, later when addiction and overdose were getting a lot of coverage in the news and the increase of opioids and heroin in Snohomish County. And most of it was surrounding the homeless community. And I wanted to just make sure that people realized, um, as Executive Summers mentioned, that this can happen to any family um, in any neighborhood and none of us are immune to the disease or the drugs that are out there. So a few years after Spencer's death, I met another mother, Kathy Lee, who happened to live in the same neighborhood that I did. I didn't know her at the time, but knew that her son had also passed from an overdose. So we began talking and from that, what we call a night to remember, a time to act, um, started. So this is our fourth annual year. And each year, um, we have tried to uh, increase the participation and the resources available. Kathy and I found that when, that we had a lot of the same struggles with our sons and very hard time finding resources, um, getting the correct medical attention. And so we just thought, you know, we've got to do something. And so we decided to come up with this event that goes along with the International Overdose Awareness Day. And to get the resources out there and just to let people know that there are, there are many, as you can see, other parents, children, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters out there that all have been affected by, by this so that they're not alone. And we hope by talking publicly about our experience that this will empower others to come forward and to fight for their loved ones by taking action because it really is, it's a battle. It can go on for years and it can be very lonely, um, shameful and um, with the stigma around it, it's just a very difficult disease to fight. So Spencer and Corey were loved by their families, friends, they were both graduates of Everett High, athletes, and college students. They should not have died this way. And we just feel we have to continue to push for science-based treatments and studies of the brain to fully understand addiction. And as, that, as was talked about with COVID-19, um, it's been very difficult for a lot of people to keep their sobriety during this time, um, just because of the isolation and the reduced access to harm reduction and treatment support. Um, loneliness and isolation, mental health, depression is all a big part of addiction. 
And so during this um, very scary time, it has definitely had a, a large impact. So we invite the community to join us at our virtual event um, this Monday, August 31st at six o'clock. The Zoom link will be provided on our Facebook page um, at a night to remember, a time to act in the Snohomish Overdose Prevention page. Our agenda will include um, two of the gentlemen that are speaking today, um, Executive Dave Summers and Dr. Spitters. And we will be talking about hope for sobriety and uh, the need for connection to people, resources and support, ways to get involved in the recovery movement, and a candlelight vigil for those who have passed and those still struggling. So I'd really like to thank the um, Sinohomish Overdose Prevention for um, partnering with us these last four years and to Snohomish County and to Hope Soldiers. Um, so we really hope that you can uh, attend our event um, and come walk away with a renewed spirit about addiction and the hope that we can and will have ways for recovery. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Debbie. So sorry for your loss also. Look forward to being with you again on Monday. Uh, we've got a couple questions for Dr. Spitter so far. Um, doctor, is there a per 100,000 number that you'd feel comfortable with in allowing or recommending some sort of return to classroom teaching uh, since 60 is not yet low enough? Well, uh, you know, lower is better. Uh, there's no magic number. Uh, the, the, that mid-range that we're now hovering in or descending through, hopefully, uh, of 25 at the low end and 75 at the high end uh, is where you start school uh, administrators and superintendents can start thinking about layering, where would we layer in the, the children most likely to benefit from, from being on site? And that typically uh, it are, are children with special needs as well as the younger children who, for whom uh, remote learning is a little, little bit less feasible. And then as rates continue to come down, you can look at putting more and more layers, kind of going up the age bracket in. And uh, that is, but it's all relative. You know, I think it's r relatively safer to look at doing that when we're on the decline rather than going up. And so we're in that zone where they can start thinking about that. And that's, you know, we're there as to counsel and advise regarding health impacts. In the end, it's going to be the schools that, that know best how to educate the kids and that have to execute the logistics for that. But we're certainly there with them. And I think one thing for us all to keep in mind is to be patient with them because even though the disease rates are changing, you know, they've already committed to a plan for September. It's very hard to to switch that all around quickly. And so we may see uh, school learning plans move a little bit uh, more slowly on the decline uh, and getting kids back into school than we otherwise might expect just because the planning and execution of those plans is not something you can just turn on a dime. And uh, just let me add from observation that those places around the country that have tried to open up schooling have many of them have quickly had to shut down and that's extremely disruptive um, you know we've tried to uh, you know, tell our employees Snohomish County what the situation is going to be in the fall with telecommuting and I think for school families with school age children to some sort of stability and planning is important um, schools seem to be extremely difficult environments to control the virus um, for obvious reasons, uh, but with a lot of kids uh, together and with uh, teachers and others. So I think it's going to be a, a slow go on uh, school reopening. Uh, but as Dr. Spitter said, I think those students most in need to be in a 
school setting and with uh, teachers and, and other people is probably the top priority. Um, so Dr. Spitters, uh, can you give us a quick rundown of where you continue to see virus activity by different age groups? Yeah, uh, by all means. I was lucky enough to see that in the chat box before we uh, uh, started uh, answering. So I thought I just, a picture's worth a thousand words. So if I may just show you this is, uh, it's a little bit uh, at first uh, look, a, li a little bit spaghetti, but if we focus in each one of these lines is the incidence uh, over time in a particular age group. And so here we are uh, at this point now, uh, we peaked in all age groups at some point in mid to late July, and things are coming down in all age groups. The highest incidence remains in individuals 20 to 29. Here's 30 to 39 and blue, yellow is 40 to 49. The green and the lighter blue are 50 to 59 and, and children and adolescents, and then folks in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. So it's still young adults that are, that are really leading the charge uh, on the cases. Uh, the good news is it's coming down in all age groups, including the elderly, for whom we had great concern that if that there was a, a spread from the younger age groups into the, the older age groups and people with medical uh, problems that make uh, that, uh, hospitalization and severe illness more likely, we might see an increase in hospitalization. So it's a, it's a great relief to see those rates coming down in the older groups as well. Another one for Dr. Spitters. Uh, with COVID, can you talk about where we are with testing and can people expect expanded criteria to get tested anytime soon? Seems like contact tracing is improving. Can you explain that? And then a follow-up question, uh, with opioids, are you seeing any areas the county hit harder or is it spread out across the county? Okay, so first, uh, testing. Uh, we're overall countywide, there's somewhere between 4,000 and 4,500 tests being done per week over the past month. Uh, the testing, of course, is, is prioritized for individuals who have symptoms of COVID, close contacts, uh, people who live or work in settings where an outbreak has occurred, and, uh, and people in high risk medical or racial and ethnic groups that are uh, disproportionately uh, showing up in hospitals uh, because of, of uh, their susceptibility. That being said, uh, uh, there's some room in the, in the system for lower risk individuals to get tested if they are, don't have symptoms, uh, but it's, it's an ever, you know, it's an ever changing um, situation. And so we don't really want to go overboard on, on broad testing of low risk people who have no symptoms. That's still a bit beyond our reach. Uh, and we're, we're focusing on those groups I mentioned. Contact tracing, uh, we've got our, our staff of 50 or so folks and their seven supervisors now well set up. They've been at it for over a month. Uh, we're getting to 70% of people within 24 hours, 80% within uh, 48 hours, and we're getting about 80, 85% of the contacts identified from the cases uh, quarantined or confirming that they're quarantined within 48 hours. So uh, I think in addition to the community's efforts to wear face coverings, limit gatherings, stay away from other folks, uh, that is starting to have an impact on bending that curve as well. And then last on the opioid question and geographic spread, looking at GIS mapping for naloxone usage and death data by zip code uh, is a process that's underway. We don't have anything uh, on that right now. Historically, there hasn't been a lot of geographic concentration. It's been pretty much proportional to population. But as we generate that, uh, that will be added to the dashboard uh, or some equivalent thereof, and we'll make sure to share that with you. Thank you. Uh, just uh, two more questions. So if we do start to open schools and start seeing virus activity rising as a result, are we prepared to shut back down quickly and will we? Uh, you know, uh, uh, I often say, you know, recycling bins are filled with predictions of the future. And uh, 
you know, it's I'm not t- trying to to hedge on anything, but you know, we we let's take as an example. Let's look at our movement into phase two, where we opened up, and then there was a resurgence of of disease, and there was some pulling back in some areas, but not a full fledged retreat back to phase one or phase zero. Uh, if we see a resurgence of of uh of covid in the wake of of more in-person learning in schools uh i imagine there would be some response to that and and the you know whether that would be you know pulling out the most recently put in kids possibly closing classrooms or schools where the problem is is more focused uh, might be more likely than broad sweeping community-wide impacts um, so it would depend on, you know, how widespread the problem is and what it's leading to. Is it leading to hospitalizations and deaths or are we just having lots of cases in, in kids in schools but no more severe consequences? Those are some of the factors that would fit in. Uh, so some response, I'm certain the magnitude and nature of it will be driven by the magnitude and nature of the problem. Just to add to that, as a reminder that there's uh, multiple levels of uh, um, organizations or um, uh, governments involved in these decisions. So the state has prepared guidance, obviously, uh, to uh, schools. Uh, Health officer Dr. Spears have provided guidance and recommendations. Um, The final decisions really so far have been made by school districts, which are independent bodies. And I would imagine, uh, as Dr. Spitters uh, mentioned, that if there were, were some openings and we saw a resurgence in case, it would be very much taken again on a school district by school district basis. Just And uh, those decisions could be made at that level. Uh, if it got really bad, it could be at a broader level, but it's really impossible to predict um, that. And But we've all been working together to make the best decisions possible. Um, so uh, final question is with uh, things starting to improve, can you discuss what your expectations are for the virus's fall, winter with the flu season? Uh, certainly. Uh, if we, uh, an optimistic outlook would be that all this social distancing and face coverings that we're doing might uh, make it difficult for influenza to establish transmission and uh, conceivably, it could be a light influenza year because of that. So I think one message is, uh, one of our key flu prevention messages is, let's keep doing what we're doing for COVID-19 and get our flu shots. Uh, uh, influenza vaccine is arriving in clinics and pharmacies now. It's generally a good idea to get vaccinated uh, you know, ideally in September or not later than early October, but, you know, aim for September. Um, it's never too early, uh, really. So go ahead and do that uh, because we, what we don't want is filling, end up filling up hospitals with both with flu patients and COVID patients and running out of room, running out of supplies. Uh, and so the, the things that are in our control, again, are getting vaccinated against the flu, all of us. Uh, but especially those who are uh, at high risk for COVID complications, and then and then uh, trying to maintain our social distancing and face coverings in public. Great, I think that wraps us up. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. This is Carrie in the Joint Information Center. We appreciate your questions and appreciate you joining us today. Please do stay tuned for future media availabilities. Thanks. <laughs>